Welcome everyone to another episode of BBC. We've got uh, Nathan Mont, Coach Curtis, here for another week of League of Legends. <sighs> another week of League of Legends. Now, I've been obsessing at the moment over a one trick over an EU. Now, okay, so where this started? What does what does obsession look like for Curtis? Is it they're watching all these vods? Yeah. So, so this guy is a, he's a talent player over in EU named Lurks. Interesting. And uh, so, so where this all started is, is that sometimes I don't feel, sometimes I don't feel like I'm equipped to do the best quality coaching, with, like especially with high reload clients. When I I need to know the the details, I need to, I need to get specific about a champion. Okay. And really, um, especially for champs that I don't play myself, that's why I try to play as many champions as possible. I've done guides for all these different champs. And with talent specific, I feel like there's stuff missing. So um, I asked uh, some of the talent players in my community to send me a list of kind of one tricks. And one of them was th this guy named Lurks. He plays on the EU server. He kind of hovers high grandmaster like challenger. And he, his YouTube channel has a bunch of, he does full game, he like posts full games, which are great. You can kind of see a full game, which is actually quite rare with no edits. So cool. And also like a lot of highlights and montages. Now, what's fascinating about this player? Um, actually, before we get into that, I want to kind of talk high level about one tricks. I want to do a shout out to all the one tricks in the world, right? I was thinking real about one tricks and I feel like one tricks are underappreciated and underutilized by the wider community. What I mean by that is the way I view it is like, okay, let's say we've got Mount Everest. At some point, so, like, you know, the Sherpas who kind of go there and, and they like, they put the stakes in and then you can kind of like follow them. Mm. And they, they, they like they basically- make it easy for people to climb Mount Everest. Yeah, they've kind of treaded that path before and they've set the, like, this is the most optimal way to kind of climb the mountain. The way I envision one tricks is that they've kind of, treaded the path for you they've done all that work they've sat in practice tool they've played all these differing builds they've experimented with stuff yeah. they've played thousands of games they've done the hard yards they've taken the losses of the elves yeah they've, they've gone down the 600 lp with the champion they've gone season in season out experimenting with bullshit losing struggling dealing with a whole wide of a uh, myriad of situations and um you can tell this guy he's gone through the works like he's tried all these different builds he's, and he's unique this guy because he does this phase rush talent, which is quite you know unique. Typically, you would see like uh, either first strike or electrocute or conquer or something like lot, that, yeah. right? But he goes phase rush, and I was really intrigued. I'm like, why does this guy go phase rush? And I started watching his games, and I was like, getting into the details here. And he kind of innovated like this very unique way of playing talent, where he would essentially um, he would kind of use his abilities very differently. Like he would basically uh, go in first with his Q R or R and then yeah so Q R and then and then what he would do is um he would like p go invisible and then pull go while he's invisible go to the back line and then pull the R through everyone and so basically what he does it's kind of like utilize the movement speed to create space in team fights really really creatively because when you think of talent you think of okay kind of one shot someone and then that's it because this build you have less damage obviously because you don't have a conqueror you don't have your electric or first strike it's less damage but the movement speed is really good for repositioning your w on talent and also uh your e scales with movement speed so you actually go over walls really really fast when you have the movement speed so he goes around and then he also builds dust blade so what happens is that he'll like go on to someone reposition in the team fight with his phase rush and his ultimate and then kill someone get the it's dust blade proc stealth. go invisible again and then you know jump over another, jump wall, over another like wall and, and like he's causing so much chaos yeah, that's the way so i actually have just finished uh my hecarim guide and one of the key things that's what you do you you're basically a full movie speed your entire gets movie yeah. speed, phase rush everything ghost nimbus cloak all that sort of stuff and some ways you should play fights is that you're you're doing damage by mispositioning the enemy. That's right. That's actually very, very similar to what this guy does. Yeah. And it got me thinking, I'm like, wow, what a what a very creative way of playing talent or creating pressure or creating impact in a game. And um, it got me really inspired. And I was just watching his games. I've been watching actually his stream and his montage and, and his gameplay basically every day for this entire week, just being really inspired and learning. And I've actually learned a lot of just watching him about the game, just like just really expanded my uh, view. And it just got me thinking, just overall, how many people are in our programs that don't actually watch one tricks? 
So what actually happened, I had another guy just by pure coincidence, an Anivia player grin in my program. And he said, Curtis, I've been watching the number one Anivia player in EU. And I can't, and, I, and I'm struggling to understand, you know, he plays the champ completely different to me. Why? And then he actually brought a VOD of him rather than rather than his own gameplay. And we just sat down and broke it down together. We got amazing learning. We got into the details and really got specific about how he's able to play this aggressive style of Nivea in lane phase. My point being here is that I feel like this is kind of like a public service announcement. For whatever champion you play, even doesn't matter if you are in gold, doesn't matter if you're in platinum or diamond, whatever. One tricks are a great way to inspire you and learn about trading patterns, learn about team fighting. Don't, you don't have to emulate every single part of their play, but it's a great way to expand your view of what's possible with your champion and inspire. I think being inspired to push your champion mastery to, and take your champion mastery to a new level. And actually, you're, you're basically cheating the system in a way because they've done the work for you. I don't have to sit there and... and, and they're the Sherpas. Yeah, they, again, they're the Sherpas. And so they can massively speed up your climb if you find one that has good quality content out there, whether they stream or have a YouTube or whatever. And most of them do. Mm. Most of them do. So... Um, for the one I think that, that comes to mind, did Slogdog create the lethality? Was I think I'm that pretty was sure him. he did. The Oris Yorick player. And he went over to EU recently... And he got to challenge it, didn't he? Yeah. And there was a montage of him playing against all these high, like really good high elo, like Zukil and stuff. Um, yeah. EU players, and they're just shocked at this, like how, like what is going on? How's it so much damage? I've never yeah. seen it before. Yeah. I thought that was really, that's really funny. Again, stuff like that, they've just come up, they've innovated it. It's they really just innovated. And and I think that, and again, it doesn't mean you have to copy their style, but I think it's really good to to try stuff and, and again, emulate the way they're using your I abilities. think you should. I think you could just go and straight up copy yeah, it. Yeah, you can straight up copy it and feel it. Yeah. And just sort of give another perspective of the champion. Um, Yeah, it's just really, really inspiring. And then, and, um, and I think for me, looking at it, and actually, this is the other interesting thing. He's landing this guy is really suboptimal. Hmm. His laning is... The, 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 the talent player. Yeah. His laning is terrible. And it got me thinking, oh, wow. He makes up for his poor laning with just really immaculate micro and skirmishing in mid-game. And again, it's a testament to, um, you know, there are many ways to climb and some champions specialize in certain skill sets than others. Yeah. And actually gave me a reality. Okay, I actually sh maybe should be emphasizing the lane stuff less with t my talent clients Absolutely. and going way deeper in the mid game in the skirmishing. Yes. So it's a really great way for me to say, okay, what's actually practical? What matters with this champion? And it, this goes a little bit of a tangent. I don't know if you've had the same experience. Experience. You know, we always are trying to better ourselves as coaches, you know, and we cringe at our coaching two years ago, right? Um, and that's normal with anyone who gets better at their job, right? We're always look you're always looking to get better. What I've realized more and more and more, and I would say Ajax really helped me with this one as well, the Yone player from my um, program. Every champion gets val more value from a particular skill. So I'll frame it this way. Talon. Talon is a perfect example. You don't need to be an overly sophisticated lane or have an amazing lane phase with Talon to be a very a high yellow Talon player. You need to be very good at skirmishing and positioning and target selection and micro and the com your combos in team fights. If you know how to get onto the back line and you know how to kill the AD carry, you can be, he, I've seen him, he's zero two in some of these situations. He dies to basic level three ganks, but his mid game is so amazing. And that is the foundation of playing a good quality talent is your team fighting and your skirmishing and your roaming and that sort of stuff. You can make up for that. So, I could work with a talent player on laning and stuff like that, but that's not really what makes a great talent player because you're so limited in your lane phase anyway. Your lane phase is pretty straightforward. You're minimizing a lot of your lanes That's anyway. not where your focus is going to be. Your exactly. Focus is, is instantly to, okay, here we go. Here's the VOD and let's just make sure you're playing team fights. Yeah, like we can skim correctly. through the lane, but again, I should be emphasizing that part yeah. of the VOD less. Yep. And so, for example, even with Yone, like I think that I, I feel like I made a bit of mistakes sometimes with my Yone clients where I overemphasize the lane sometimes and underemphasize the mid game and the R usage and some of the team fights. And if I were to go back in time, I would probably switch my emphasis. And so right now I'm in the process with my coaching is just just double checking and triple checking that I've got the right emphasis on the right skills for each and every champion. 
Um, so that's something I'm currently kind of working on as a coach right now. Have you had the same experience with Jungle? Like, for Absolutely, example, like Carthus versus Rex I or whatever? Like oh, that? yeah, for sure, 100%. I, I, when I uh, did my Wukong guide for my Soto Academy, I when I started, I completely changed the way I, I was coaching Wukong completely because I realized that the way you win games with Wukong is purely from doing that full combo. That's it, just that one full combo. And, and W usage. People were completely thinking about W as a defensive ability rather than you were meant to think about it as an offensive ability. Right. You need to double for the double Q. Um, and yeah, I had um, Alec, we went over a lot about his team fighting skirmishing and I think it was Nicholas as well. And yeah, just in the VODs, just straight bang on, like skip through the early game, literally in like two minutes, through, bang, bang, bang. Yep. First ult, second ult, third ult. And then just there's so much more progress. Yeah, they can way. miss probably gank windows. They Couldn't can, care less. It doesn't matter. As yeah. long as they do this thing well. You've got to figure that fe- step first, one. That's first, that's step one. Yes. If they can't combo, when there's no point reviewing the rest of the game. Exactly. And that's kind of, I feel like it's our responsibility for each and every champion. This is why our coaching needs to be, have a huge emphasis on the champion that we're coaching. Well, that's our, that's what our philosophy code is, the BBC pyramid. Champion. The champ, number three, the champion. Champ identity and like your reference points with the champion yes. itself. Yes. That's what we're so, talking about here, right? So important. And that's what you figured out with Talon. Yes. And I feel like I was wrong with Talon. That's what I'm kind of, in a long-winded way, I was wrong with Talon. And then, and studying one tricks I've done and I think Talon because it's not it wasn't the most popular I champion. don't think you were now that I think about it, you weren't wrong with Talon you just uh, your default is like alright you know control major stuff like lane phase is really important right so you just apply that to champs that you don't really yeah think, and, and I, I've, I've kind of gone that's, that's what I realize that I do right so if I haven't really played like a, a scaling champ like Lilia or you know Hecarim right. sort of stuff I will default to the early game jungle to what you know is to what I know get success regardless yeah, yeah. But I feel like as well, so this is the we, reference points. yeah. But that's you know that it still can get results, but it's not in the it's not in the most efficient way. No, that's right. So that's why, like again, I feel like for me, Talon was that champion. I I feel like I've worked on it for the majority of others. I I actually had to go out of my way to 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 refine my Aurelian soul as well and stuff like that. But for the most part, Talon was the one feel the one champ for me that just didn't feel right. And now I'm glad that I've kind of done my research there. So. Um, yeah, in a long-winded way. Shout out to the One Tricks, and I think they're really an amazing resource that we should utilize. On this note, I had a client that come into me, and he shocked me massively. His name's Alex. He came in with a Kiana, a Kiana game, and typically when when I get a Kiana player, there's a lot of like connotations that are around a Kiana player. You know, where Kiana players are typically quite dopamine, dopamine fiends. Like Katarina players, like Valksor, like he's just a pure dopamine fiend in my program. I can win every fight. Oh yeah, they just can't, they struggle to say no. And um, they're typically not the most strategic players. They're more more focused on the micro. Again, same as Talon, right? Talon players, Katarina players, Kiana players, Fizz players, things like that. Uh, Even Yasuo players. Now, you know, we came into this review and I was expecting there to be some, you know, pretty egregious mistakes typically there is with these sorts of players in terms of not playing around win conditions and stuff like that now this player he literally i was going through i'm like wow okay that's very thoughtful like and he said something like oh yeah i didn't want to use r here because dragon's coming up and i didn't want to go for the because dragon's coming up in 30 seconds whoa what rank is this and this was in diamond wow and i was incredible and he's like killing it right now he's just yeah. climbing he's dominating right now and yeah. i'm like wow and, and we can't, i was getting halfway through the ball i'm like this is some very high level stuff. And then he's like, yeah, what he said, Curtis, what I did recently was I went through all of my R's, right? With playing Keanu, I went every single R. And then he would ask himself, what did I get from this R? What was the value of this R? And then not, a, and, and so look at what he got. Question. And then, okay, if I didn't use it, what would I have gotten? And then what he realized is that with Kiana, having your R for those major objectives fights was so important. Mm. Rift Herald fights and dragon fights. Mm. So he realized that oftentimes he would, it's better off for him to give a kill, even though he could get this kill, just to have his R ready for that dragon fight, call for dragon. He can get more kills, more impact, high impact kills. And it worked. And he's been killing it. And he's climbing through diamond. He's getting towards high diamond there. And, and it, I was like, Wow, that right there is the power of thoughtfulness in your review, having a focus and intention with a specific aspect of your gameplay. But there's a lot in your R usage. If you're playing any champion that revolves around your R, if it's Ari, Twisted Fate, Zed, Ione, there is so much, you know, we talk about there's so much information in a death. There is a metric ton of information in an R usage. Yep. 
uh the my saying is in a review if i get a review like that i say i like the way you're thinking i like that's what i say it's like a meme like i say it all the time like mm. i like the way you're thinking about the game here mm. mr x mm. yeah i do have those sometimes i was loving it i was i was thoroughly enjoying it and then you know there was some nitpicks here and there but for the most part you can just tell he was playing incredibly thoughtful league of legends and you could tell that he'd reviewed similar situations like this before. He'd put himself in similar situations. He's experimented. What happens if I don't use my R here? What happens if I do use it here? He's kind of thought that, kind of on the checks and balance. Okay, what do I get versus what do I lose? Absolutely beautiful. Love it. Power of high quality questions. Very, very important. Did you want to talk about one of your topics? Yep. All right, so I got actually a... Uh a bit of a funny one here. There's a iron player recently. Have you seen this, Curtis? No. Who bought an 1100 LP in account. I have not seen this. And what is it on? Was it on Reddit? This is... Um, I actually saw it from YouTube from Rival. He made okay. a video on this, a highlight in this. And oh I've God, never seen anything like this. So, Curtis, out of curiosity, what do you what do you think would happen? Is this a genuine iron player? He's a genuine iron player, yes. And he bought an 11... What server? Uh, this is on the, I think it's the North American server. Uh, well, I think, what role does he play? He is pretty much playing everything, support. Well, so, it, 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 okay. I mean, I think that he would be... He's, I mean, literally he would every champion. basically lose nearly every game. How many games do you think in? Um, I think he would lose... I would say, depending on the role he played, but yeah, probably like 90, 90 something plus of his games. 95%. Yep. yep. He had a 10% win rate. Oh, all right. All right. Um, he was, yeah, losing about, yeah, every one game he would win. So he would actually win some games. and uh, There and would be the game. ultra, like, yeah. yeah, everyone's stomping and yeah. he's just getting hardcore carry. Now, my next question to you, Curtis, mm -hmm. I was going to show the, uh, the, I just want to just get the curiosity okay. here. How long do you think it took him to go from, in terms of, we're talking about they were testing the MMR system here okay. for Riot Games, from, you know, playing in challenger lobbies to uh, now he's playing in Silver 3 MMR games. Whoa. How many games do you think that took? I'm going to say, so if he's, if, if he's winning one in, it, one in 10, I would say, so... Yeah, like 50 games. Yep, 50 games, spot on. Is it actually 50? 50 games and he's playing... I actually haven't seen... I promise you guys I have not seen <laughs> Curtis this. Curtis is cheating there. I'm What's just, going on? Literally, I have not seen this. I swear on my life. All right, so yeah, I'll show you the OPGG here, Curtis, all right? So <laughs> I'll put this up on the screen here. So here's uh, a recent uh, leasing game. He has 16 deaths. So he's so right now he's Platinum 1. But look at this. He's playing in Bronze 1, Silver right. 4 games. So right? he's in Platinum, but he's got Bronze MMR. That's right. So okay. And then so that was two days ago. And then we'll go into a week. So this guy's spamming a lot of games. Uh, let's go to uh, this game here. Imagine the ranked anxiety Look at this. he would have had. 21 days ago, he's playing in Challenger, <laughs> Challenger games. This is an oh, Ezreal game, 1-3-0. It would have been the lowest impact. How fascinating is that, and guys? And that's just going to show. Uh, the MMR system is, is fixed people up pretty well. Pretty quick, 50 pretty games. Pretty well. He's ba ba basically already where he should be. Yep, he's, he's, and he's on the way down still, even now. His last game in bronze was 16 death leads in-game, and then he had 10 deaths as Karzix. So, and 13 deaths so as So was Karzix. this an experiment? Like, what, did we know I don't know. I, actually don't, I don't know anything about him, but uh, yeah, this was just a, a post about wow. uh, some guy that did this. And it's really interesting because those accounts are apparently really expensive. They go from five hundred to three thousand dollars. So wow. I don't know what this guy's intention was, but it's a very interesting experiment to see this is the reality of uh, yeah the matchmaking system doing its job. Wow, I wonder what he thought would happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know what did he think Maybe, was going to happen? I, think, I mean, is it is it Maybe as, like a is it as delusional as like oh like I'm I'm iron, but I'm actually like a challenger player. I can play in challenger <laughs> lobbies. And imagine like what what he would thought when he won some of those games. Yeah, I, I'm and just again, trying to look. He, I think he won like three of like twenty games. Right. So you know he's not winning. I mean, much props at all. to those people. And that he's playing Yumi, him. so he's playing Yumi and stuff. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, yeah. My, and I was imagine the ranked anxiety. Imagine playing. Imagine. An I don't think he player. had ranked anxiety. He spammed the shit out of ranked dude in in the spam of. <laughs> yeah. So so the title of the rival video was. This is the the 1400 LP drop in like nine days. It's like the highest. It's like a record of like the high, the lowest, uh, biggest drop in LP of all time. Wow. So I thought that was really funny. I, um, 
I did an Ari guide recently, Nathan. And uh, there was a comment that I want to get your psychoanalysis on. And I want to see what you what you think of this. So, um, so I did a, you know, in my guide, I went over the builds, obviously, of Ari. And builds are quite, you know, always quite controversial. And this guy was an Ari player. And he wrote this very long um, thing about, kind of the builds. Um, so one of my, so basically one of my points was there is three styles of Ari. There is typically the Ludens with like uh shadow flame, very like squish, you're squishy, but you do a lot of like a boatload of damage, more one shot with Sorks, that sort of thing. There's Everfrost, which is kind of like a hybrid, a little bit more utility, cheaper, cheaper mythics spike earlier in the game. And then you have the Leandris. So there's typically, which is more like scaling into the mid to late game, tank shred, sustained damage, that sort of thing. And um, this guy basically had a comment about how um, Everfrost is just as effective as the uh, Assassin playstyle as Ludens, if not better. Um, essentially, you know, it says about, you know, a, a lot of like um, numbers and stuff like that and kind of sends this long-winded thing. And I said, appreciate the feedback. And then I just said, I disagree with Everfrost being as effective as uh, being an assassin as Ludens, despite all the numbers. I'm a field guy and the other high elo Aries that I've spoken to tend to agree with me here as well. Um, and then, and this is where it gets interesting. So he said, uh, thanks for the feedback. The, to be honest, this Everfrost discussion to me is the greatest mystery I've ever encountered in League of Legends. I made a post about this over a year ago on the Ari subreddit, and to this day, it is still by far the most controversial post I have ever made. Since then, I talked to multiple different high elo Ari mains, and pretty much every single time it ends similar to this, where people just disagree with me, but not a single person has ever given me a proper reasoning why they disagree or any evidence to disprove my claims. The reasons are usually along the lines of that they simply don't believe in my numbers without any proof, or why try to argue that 20 damage uh, isn't even half an auto attack, blah, 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 blah. Uh, or the biggest argument is that Ludens feels better. And to me, this feelings argument is very problematic because it is impossible to argue against feelings. But feelings aren't this magical, unchangeable thing. They are just the logic of your subconscious intuition. That's why feelings are an amazing tool to listen to during the game where you don't have the time to think. Um, but when you're outside of the game, theory crafting builds, we have all the time in the world. Um, this is the place where science and numbers rule, not feelings. So when you say Ludens feels like a better assassin item, I encourage you to try and deconstruct these feelings. Try to find the reason of your intuition that tell you that Ludens is better. Um, and kind of goes in here, you know, so when people decide to go Ludens or Everfrost, they know the actual advantages of their choice. Okay, that's basically it. Um, and then he said, Ludens, the main thing is Ludens, it's equally good burst against squishies, more late game damage scaling, so it's noticeable at four plus items, more DPS, I didn't do any concrete tests if it has 15 or 5% more DPS, slightly better, uh, that's basically it anyway. So, you know, without getting into the details about this specific case, what do you make of this whole, um, this comment? Builds. Build. In terms of feel versus... Like numbers, and have you ever had an experience where a build on paper, like someone said, a build on paper has been good, but it just doesn't feel good for you, and you would prefer to build something else? I mean, I, in all my coaching, me personally, builds has just never been something I've really cared about. I will just copy something and then maybe adjust it here and there. So, have you ever used numbers to dictate your builds? Never, not once. It's all feel and just copying other people, just how you like one tricks and all that sort of mm. stuff. It's just a really boring part of the game for me. Mm. So that's just me personally. I'm just trying to think of any examples here of like, uh, let's say one of my students, like I was like mentioning one build, like I reckon you should go this, and then I was completely wrong about it after. Like even then, I mean, even then, different builds have different play styles as well. You know, like uh, I remember my, uh, I played Volley Bear a very certain way last year. Mm. Uh, where um, Shern actually brought the build to me where you go, what was it last year? It was uh, Sunfire. Sunfire was like the item you could build, right? It was like a mythic, right? Was it? Yeah. I think it was Sunfire yep. into Frozen Heart. Mm. Um, and like no other Volibear plays, but it changed the way you play the game. You play more as like a, uh, you don't really have as much early power because you don't mm. do as much damage mm. as like a Divine Sundra Volibear or something like that. But you're able to, um, oh, sorry. No, it was the Chem Tank. Chem Tank. 
uh, people go chem tank volley bear. And I said, I don't want to chase people's volley bear. I want people to come into me mm. and not because I hate to queue in after people because it's really easy and it's really easy to dodge and flash and all that sort of stuff. So that completely changed the play style of the champion. So I guess my experience with builds is more so changes the 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 style of how you're playing the champion rather than a numbers better than the numbers exactly. make this better or not. That's exactly what I was going to say is that yeah. there's so much more to items than sheer numbers no. because you've got to remember the functionality of a, an item itself. So it's so it's super, super interesting because you've got people like this who love Everfrost and kind of think Everfrost was great. And then you've got people, I think there's the, the LPL caster. He's has this huge rant about why Everfrost is not good and is a fan of Ludens. You've kind of got these parties that are absolutely obsessed with particular items. But what you've got to fail to realize, what these, all these people fail to realize, in my opinion, is that the items change the way you play. And, and and we're not, it's very rare in League that we're just hitting a target and we're going to dump all our damage on one target. You got to think about when we're going to, okay, by what time are we going to be yeah, hitting the that timing's guy? really important. Like for example, again, the Volley Bear, it's more cost effective in competitive. Everyone was going Kim's because it made sense. It's more of a competitive thing. That's rather. right. And then the feel of my build was more scaling, more reliable Volley Bear that could win me more solo Q games. That's right. So you got to think of it. Okay, when is, when is my damage actually going to come online? What is my role with this build? Like, how does this shape my role in my identity and a composition? And how does it change how I use my abilities and how I team fight? But then also, you know, what makes sense in this ELO bracket and the way games are playing out? Is it fast? Is it slow? But also just in general, like, how do I like to play my champion as well? Sometimes it might be more efficient to build XYZ, but I just don't like the feel of it. Sometimes no. that can also be the case mm. as well. Mm. My point being here in this case is to expand on this one specifically, right? So look, basically his point was saying that like, I think for the, for the early game, I think one to two items, Everfrost actually does very similar damage, but Ludens does more damage later on as you go in the game, like three, four items. But the thing with this Ludens style is that a lot of the time you're not really pushing the pace of the game. You're only pushing the pace of the game when you're playing Everfrost. Everfrost is better when you're getting shit done. You're like, it's a cheaper mythic. You're usually not going Sorks with it. You're going to pair it with uh, Lucidity. And that's also something to keep in mind, by the way. If you build one item, that's also going to change the other items you build with it, right? Because think about it. With with uh, with Everfrost, you're probably not going to build Sorks. You're probably going to overemphasize the ability haste and get the earlier spiking Ionian boots. It all kind of synergizes together perfectly. So you're also getting less damage through your boots as well, right? Less a uh, magic pen. My point being here is that Everfrost and Leandries is a, is a more of a faster, it's, it's fast paced and it's also better into low range champions and stuff yeah. like that. So now, you, now you're getting more into the details of the, against specific combat. How do you use it? Like, like, let's say for example, I'm playing a tank jungler, right? And I've got an Everfrost Ari, like guys, we're doing negative damage like this game. You know what I mean? Like, so sometimes I see an Ari build a certain way. I'm like, oh, I don't, it's actually not a threat. I actually shouldn't even be going on her at all. Right. Because, and then when she has Ludens, it's like, oh, well, you know, that's a really scary. Something we got to keep in mind, yeah. right? But, it, and, and what I'm saying is that like, when I build Ludens a lot of time, I know that I'm not building Ludens to one-shot people at one item. And then I th it is a still a big spike and it's similar damage to Everfrost. But later on, I'm going to have genuine threat on the squishies at three items. Yeah. Like it's later on in the game, I can still be a hardcore assassin. Ari can't be a hardcore assassin at three items with Everfrost. You yeah. kind of turn into like this more versatile, you know, skirmisher that's peeling slash, you know, making picks utility. and stuff like that. Utility, utility more champ. utility. Yeah. So my point being is that I always get really intrigued by these conversations because, and it's really hard to have these conversations because it almost feels like there's an infinite depth you can go. And, and then, and then and really it boils down at the end. If you really go through this conversation, What's the final outcome? Like you go put on all these little, I view like a funnel and you put all these, no, it's like a blender. You put all these ingredients into the blender. You know what pops out of the end? It's just a case by case basis. Let's get into the details. Let's <laughs> yeah. get specific about yeah. what we're, and look, look at the game specific plan. Game. Let's look at the fucking game. Yeah, that's right. That's really what it boils down yeah. to. Yeah, that's what everyone misses with the builds and stuff. <laughs> you and know? I, just no, I just never see gameplay for some reason. Yeah, it's just never gameplay attached. Just show I, me a game with some examples, please. I got, I got linked a, a build video about Everfrost. It was an hour long and it, had not, it didn't really have a single clip. Didn't have a single clip. What are we doing, guys? So it's very, very hard, in my opinion, to talk about items without showing. Mm. Let's like, let's show a bunch of show me a bunch of clips. Show me ten clips where this person built this item, and then if they had this item, how that would change, and then talk about okay, would it have affected their early game? Would they have had this item by that this fight, or what, and how would that have affected their lane phase? Because the components are different as well, right? There's a lot of detail that you need to get really cover there in terms of practicality. So. 
Yeah, I know. It's just interesting, an interesting observation and how, you know, there's an infinite level of depth that you can go into when it comes to itemization. Yeah, and, and it needs to have evidence as well as like it's been able to consistently climb, especially in the higher ranks. For That's example, right. do you think that anyone will be playing Slog Dog's Lethality build if he couldn't get it to work? It would yeah, be do you think it was, it, was some, it was some random diamond to Yorick one Not trick? even. I'm, we're talking about like a platinum or a gold player that's right. come up with this. Like, like even, I mean, you know, even on paper, if they're right, we've got to see practical use case of this in ranks because that's what we're, we're playing the game of League of Legends. Time back ranks. to Lurks with the phase rush down, build, build doing There's this style. practical style. uses. He, uses yeah. he plays a certain style with it and you can't talk about the style in the build numbers. It has to be shown. It has to, has be, to shown. be shown. Talking about champ mastery, while we're on this topic, uh, I want to shout out Kimmy. She, if my blow gold program, she recently hit gold. And the funny story about this is that uh, she was in silver for quite a while playing Zyra. She was a Zyra player, Zyra mid player. And Zyra is not a champion that's approved in my program. So we have a set of kind of approved champions, yep. just like in your program. Yep. It's like, I think mine's like, I think I've got like 12 or something, 13 champions where they can, like, we have content made on those champions. These are champs we deem to be great for climbing to gold, right? Yep. Great for learning the game. Great climbing. for learning the game. She didn't play one. She decided not to play one. I respect it, whatever. She was stuck. So she's like, you know what? I'm going to play Aurelian Soul, which is one of the champs that have proved. She got gold within, I think it was in the space of 30 games. And how long was she stuck in silver for? It's like months. You know, months. Um, and my point here, again, this is not to kind of champ shame or anything. My point being is that, you know, you need to understand if you're going to, not if you're going to play an off meta pick if you're going to play a pick that's objectively weak you got to be okay with being significantly lower and not getting the same results but a lot of people think they're okay with that until they play a champion that is actually genuinely good in their role or a solid champion and then like a lot of the time they they end up just dropping that champion that they thought they were going to play anyway i right. i can't i can there are so many clients that I've had that say, look, I really, really want to play this champion. And then I'm like, all right, well, it's going to be hard. And they, they stick with it. A month later, they come back. Oh, I don't want to play it anymore. And they just play the one that we recommended that they kind of like. Sometimes they hate it. They still like it. Just not love it. And then they're way happier because they're actually getting, they're actually playing the game of League of Legends without sitting in lane and losing it 20 minutes or whatever. Mm. My point being is that, you know, we if you are one of those off-meta player champions, you better know and be completely okay with the idea that you could be at least 400 LP lower at minimum than what you might be with a good quality, solid meta champion. Yep. Not necessarily meta, even just a solid champion that is designed for the role that's good, somewhat good in solo queue. Mm. 400 LP. Would you say that's accurate in your experience? Is it 400 LP or is it less or is it more? Yeah, I mean, that's maybe more on this. I guess it sort of depends on the ranking as well, right? Uh, no, I actually don't, think, don't think it think does. So? I think it actually is Just on everything. Yeah, yeah you're probably right. I think actually. it basically yeah. 400 LP across the board, no yeah. matter what. Yeah, whether it's like bottom, because you got to get up your skill level in terms of the fundamentals. So basically, you're saying like, if you, if you play that champion, um, that's like a really good champion. Well, I'm not saying I'm not saying you're playing a really good champion. I'm playing like just like an okay champion. Yeah, like like an okay champion. Yeah. Like for example, I've got a Rise client that you know struggling with Rise, and then okay, let's pick Syndra or something, you yeah. know, or Ariel. Just yeah. like a star. Doesn't have to be the meta or the meta, the best champ on the patch, but it has to be just a solid or a Victor or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, something that is tried and true and works in solo queue mm. in that role. Yeah. I guess it's sort of like with those people that play off meta, like. I almost want them to like create like a, a a PowerPoint presentation for me because that's what I've been doing with my guides. Mm. Like, and just break down like, so how are you going to use every ability? Like, what's the mm. point? How do you use every ability in fights? Like, how do you actually win a game with this champion? What does it look like? And mm. I feel like that if uh, they actually get down to the presentation, figure out how to win a game, it's like, okay, they, they might not want to do that. <laughs> yeah, they might not want to do it. Want to do it like dude, that, dude. Like, it's just ways. Like, let's let's say that for for example that Zara, right? Like, uh. She has to. Oh, I'm just pulling stuff out my ass here. Like, has I to don't hit, really know. I think you would have you to like game is, uh, spitballing. You would have to, yeah. I mean, get a bit of poke down. Um, can be there early for major objective fights. Try and control zones. Kind of play like a 
like an Anivia type thing, like kind of control zones with your plants and stuff, and then peel back for your eighty carry and play front to back team yeah. fights. And so then I'm thinking, farm really well. So then again, it's like okay, well you could that, and then you just copy and paste that to another champion that actually is the actual job. And then she played Asol, which, is, which is very similar. Yeah, it's just better and at just doing that. Way better. So if you actually get it down to yeah, the presentation, you're like doing okay, the same thing. I'm doing the same thing, but why am I just disavenging myself? That's right. Yeah, and it's a shame. I would love it if a lot of these champions were the same, but that's just the reality of the game, unfortunately. Um, especially if you're playing these very, very weak champions. So, um, yeah, I'm not there to discourage, again, these players that really want to obsess about a champion because, again, we love one tricks as well. We kind of said at the start, we love one tricks. People who are obsessed and love about the champions. But you need to understand the contract that you're signing. And if you're miserable, if you're ever miserable playing your main champion like that, that's a red flag. Do you think that Lurks guy who plays Talon is miserable playing Talon? No, he's in Fairyland playing... He's having a blast. He's playing hard style, and just, <laughs> yeah. you know, doing that. And the, and the Anivia player in EU smokes Shisha while playing. He's having a blast, you yeah. know? Like, these, play, these players are chilling yeah they love their champions yeah that's the level of obsession you've got to have if you want to be a one trick yeah um so i have another topic here curtis talking about uh more psychology of solo queue so a really interesting thing i've been watching on netflix um it's funny how do we do we have a curse curtis of anything that we see anything we consume anything we always try and relate it to how it can be relatable to league of legends or improving league mm. of legends mm. it's just a thing that we always okay. do because we think about this all the yeah. time right yeah so when you're watching a movie a tv show a youtube video you're always thinking hmm how can this relate to league of legends improving? i think anything that is remotely competitive or like the mastering of a craft. yeah master of a craft it's like george yeah i'm not gonna watch and seinfeld stuff. and think about league of legends yeah that's right like, okay yeah. Chappelle show but yeah. like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, guess, I guess it depends on the anything context. that it looks like like cooking or or anything sport related or finance related yeah I, I i could say that so yeah watching this finance show it's called on netflix it's just recent it's called how to get rich um and it's sort of just about uh, couples and being in debt and f being really financially irresponsible people and stuff right and people in debt and, and learning how to how be financially responsible. responsible that's right and how and uh, the thing i love about the show is talking about the psychology of money mm. right so, you know the psychology of league of legends and so this is if you like watch that show you're like this guy gets into details like what you do like so he gets into the details of the psychology of money. yeah of the psychology which is affecting the decision making so he's like peeling it's like back stage the four yes. it's like stage four yes. of how you perceive of, money of and then that and money because that's going to influence how you spend money yeah that's and then how you perceive it. money it's like your relationship with money yep absolutely that's what he says right quote, unquote. Yeah, so it's so cool. really good right so i'm loving it yeah there's this specific thing he said there's this couple um and he said that in general from what he's found is that when people are in lots of debt they refuse to look at their bills and the reason being is that it's not about the numbers and being really far in debt. What it does is if they open up those pieces of paper, it tells a story. There's so much actually in the numbers and the mm. purchases. Like it, it, you have to actually come to terms with yourself. It's like, I'm a compulsive, but I can't control my compulsions. I've just wasted 10 years of my life. Like you actually, these are the things that actually right. we're telling ourselves. Like, it's like, this is what this paper actually means. And, mm. and they don't want to, they don't sort of, they don't want to accept reality. They would rather keep it piling over there, even though it's not logical. And it's really interesting. People might think it's like, oh, that's only for like certain type of people. These are really smart people here on, on the show. The people that specifically that they just let bills uh, um, um, build up. The, the wife was earning $250,000 a year. And the husband was like an electrical engineer or whatever like that. But he's like a stay-at-home dad now. These are smart people, okay? The lo there's no logic there, is it? Like, I have to pay those bills It's an emotional decision. It's emotional. And again, because, they, they, because they're really bad at talk with money with, it, about, with each other, it's if they open up those bills, that just shows their relationship is really dysfunctional. They don't want to accept the reality. Mm. They'd rather just go in la-la land and be like, yeah, our relationship is fine. Again, it tells a story. Mm. And I thought the same thing with ranked and people reviewing and looking at and accept the yes. reality of their gameplay. If you review your game and look at the mistakes, people would rather blame their teammates, blame champion, blame meta, blame builds, because they they know. Again, everyone's really smart. We're really smart here. People are aware that Faker is good at the game. Like, there's a skill, right? We all know that logically. But if we look at the level of mistakes, that tells a story about if we actually accept our level of play. It tells us, you know, for example, things like, um, holy shit, I actually have so much work to do. This is this game's way hard. Like, this is hard. Another one, another story that might be that you uh, might be told is uh, I had actually someone recently joined the academy today, and he was saying I've been playing for I've been I've been playing since season three, and he's like I wish that I had a process in those like all those years, and like now he's like actually trying the game. Uh, for example, another one, uh, what happens if I actually tried and failed? You know, so there's all these 
avoiding reality when we actually face reality it actually tells a story about ourselves our life flaws everything like that i thought that was really interesting so so amazing that you share that today because i literally covered the basically exact same thing today with one of my um he's kind of like a, a guy who helps out in the discord he's like kind of kind of like an mla coach named so hill and he runs the dojo the 1v1 dojo in my in my mla program very really, really really amazing guy and he's very knowledgeable about the game and he brought in a VOD today with me and we got into the details, right? We get into this this VOD, right? Playing Oriana into Swain. And there's already a, a alarm bells ringing here. He was getting shoved in by a Swain by, as Ori, kind of like level one. And and then you can see how progressively as the lane one went on, he was getting more and more flustered and there was some more mechanical errors and things like that. Anyway, I ended the review at like eight minutes. I said, dude, just what's going on here? And... You know, basically the conclusion that we came to is that he was writing every mistake off as a micro mistake. Yeah. Without, so rather than getting into the details and like c confronting that he doesn't have the matchup understanding, whatever it might be, it's so convenient for him to just write it off. And be like, oh yeah, micro mistake, <clears throat> micro mistake, not really get, like actually review the games properly. Yeah. Similar to that because he didn't want to face the reality of the he, player he is, he is now. He has an idea, a picture of the player he wants to be or the or player thinks he, is. he thinks he yes. is. Yes, the player he thinks he is. And he knows that if he gets into those details and 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 exposes this, that there is there's going to be this massive gap that just emerges which there's him where he's actually at versus where he thinks he's at. And that's fucking painful. It's so painful. That's why they sit there and they let the bills, you know, financially. That's where people get into debt and stuff like that. And same with Lee. They yeah. never improve. They never stuff. improve. Because we see this commonly. Reality. And it's also it's very, very, very common in this ELO bracket of that high diamond low master. Hmm. That's where you see it commonly the most. I mean, you see it in every element, but I would say that's the most because it is very painful to kind of see, because you have like a, an enlarged ego a lot of the time when you start to get into diamond and you start to get to master to your ego starts to get out of control and you think, oh my god, I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be an, I'm gonna be a challenger player. I'm gonna play with pros. I'm gonna do all this stuff. But then you start looking at your gameplay and you're like, fuck me, like I'm making pretty basic mistakes. You can't accept that reality, right? Because then if you look at that reality, then you're gonna realize, oh shit, I'm actually am maybe not as good as I thought it was. And it's then tough. It's, it's tough. tough. And the stories that you thought about yourself are just not true. And he, for, yeah. cha for champion uh, understanding and stuff like that, that means he's going to have to learn all these, all these, these matchups, match this knowledge. And let's say if he's especially a coach as well, so I'm mm. talking for coaches, coaches are really bad at accepting real level play for their skill because then what does that mean about their coaching skill? What does skill? that mean about their coaching skill? Yeah. What have they thought they could do and stuff? So yeah, it's these stories that we we build for the, ourselves. 100%. Really. And and I actually think I've been guilty of that in the past. Absolutely. Like for me, that like, was me. Because we talked last episode about this, uh, if I couldn't accept when I came back to the game, being a challenger player in season three, four, five, to came back season nine, season 10, being platinum one, diamond four, if I actually was real about my level of play, imagine the story that is broken there. Because my story that I was telling myself is, I just need more games to get back mm. to my challenger rank. But I actually realized I had to have a process, had to get into the details, but I couldn't accept the reality. I was just letting the bills just stack up because I would never face that because I would shatter my reality. Yeah, and, and what I've learned over time with this is that at the end of the day, um, if if a client was going to leave because I didn't know a matchup, I mean, uh, that's that. I mean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cry over spilled milk if a, if a person is that upset that I didn't know the specifics of a match. I'm honest a lot of the time. If I don't know a matchup, I, I've done this many many times. I'll just go into a review. Mm. And then just say, all right, let's go into YouTube and search this matchup. And I'll say, look, I actually don't really know much about this matchup. Let's try and figure it out and we'll try and kind of reverse engineer it. But I think back in the day, I would try to, I would kind of like, like hide, I guess, or I don't know what the right word is, like uh, pretend that I knew what exactly what to do in this situation. Sometimes I don't know what to do in this situation. I'll, and I'll have to sit there and be like, hmm, yeah, I actually don't know, think I would know. I would make that mistake. Like I will say that, like I would make that mistake. And there's no shame in that because I think if anything, it promotes um, trust, right? Like, and and I and that, that we've been through a similar journey. Like, we're we're also struggling solo queue players, you know? we're all struggling on the same, the same journey. And and um, yeah, I really, and I really empathize with Sohil this morning because I understand how painful that will be. And especially for him doing the, running the one v one dojo, he should be the one. That's you know, right. He's probably got yes. an image of the person that he thinks he should he be. Is, yes. 
Um, but the quicker you set reality, yes. then you can implement a plan. We can process, and then we can start. You, you know, can build and bolster up that 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 champion master and that matchup understanding. We can start. Let's say again using the financial example. We can start realizing what we need to start cutting. We need to figure out how to pay off this debt. You know, create a plan rather than just doing the same thing. And that time. is, and you know, one of the uh, defense mechanisms there in in reference to the financial stuff is not looking at the the accounts or the bills or whatever. It's like the people that have refused to look at their bank account in, as well. I just don't want to see it. <laughs> the, the reality is there, whether you like and it the, or not. And, and there are other defense mechanisms. Some of them are are making new accounts. All right, that's another one. Having pumped up MMR because that's going to get you that rank mm. with the same gameplay. Mm. And then you get that confidence, that short-term confidence boost from the new MMR and you get the high rank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what happens? The MMR normalizes. You keep playing. You start dropping. Oh, oh shit. Uh, you know, and then and then you, you start, you know, dropping, dropping. And then, and then, okay, make a new account or whatever it might be. And, and then another defense mechanism is... Um, writing everything off as a micro mistake or a blunder oh, yeah. silly mistake silly mistake there i wouldn't make that mistake if i were in that situation again you know there's many many of these defense mechanisms that we have blaming teammates is obviously the most one blaming the matchmaking system loser's cue i want to talk about a, a little interesting story here we'll change the battery and then we'll come back let's, let's do it yeah so while we're on this topic i um I had my classic slump after doing a guide. So when I do a guide, I play a lot of a champion. I blind pick it essentially. Yep. I was doing really, really, really well in solo queue, like top 10 and everything. And then I started spamming Ari blindly to get content for the guide, right? And play, just get a lot of experience on the champion. Even if I didn't want to play the champion and even if I wasn't feeling it. And then also, even if it wasn't a great Ari game, I was just picking it, blind picking it no matter what. And ultimately, like this happens with all of my champions when I do guides, I feel very dirty, like with that champion towards the end. I'm like, I just don't want to touch this champion at the yeah, moment. I don't want to see it. I don't want to throw another Ari charm. I'm sick of it. Yeah, and I, and I got myself in a pretty big like slump, and then and then um, yeah, I was just in a bad like a bad bit of a bad mental state. I was just glad to get the guide kind of out and done, and I was like really um like I don't know what the word I'm not tilted, but I was just in a bad mood, I guess, from like. I was, and I, I could tell so I was, there was a lot of like emotion kind of pent up right there. And I'm like, you know, we talk about reflection. So what I, what I did, I went, went into the shower and I was just thinking in the shower and I come out and I was just thinking, okay, I started, you know, getting these narratives. These narratives are coming up like, oh my God. Um, Cause I had this really rough block and like, you know, teammate this, uh, X person, this, you know, just literally the, the classic bullshit narratives in the back of my mind, creeping out of nowhere. Right. And I'm like, okay, Curtis. I'm going to use myself as a experiment here. What would I say to this narrative to a client if a client said this? Great question. And I just said, okay, well, okay. If a client said that, what would I say? Okay, I would actually call them out. I would say, well, you are the, the sole contributing factor in all your games. Yeah. <laughs> um, how are you contributing to the game states? Um I would also say, you know, are you influence? Are you influencing the negative states, or are you griefing draft and stuff like that, or you know, by blind picking your mid champ and stuff like that, counter picking yourself? Like, I just kind of asking myself all these questions that I would ask a client, and then I'm like, oh yeah, it actually, you know, kind of makes sense in a way. But I was still emotional, and those narratives were still there, even though I could logically, like, I could logically kind of like answer and and uh, I guess critique my own bullshit. But I just wasn't ready to even have that conversation. And I'm just like, all right, well, that's interesting. And now, and again, that also makes me realize there are probably some clients that are in a bad mental state. They come to a session and they're not ready or they angrily type something in the Discord like, Curtis, what do I do when my teammates do that? So yeah, what do I do in this game really state? Really shitty questions. And, and, <clears throat> and no matter what you say to those people and even no matter what anyone would have said to me in that situation, it wouldn't have actually no. changed how I felt. The only remedy, at least for me in those situations, is get off the goddamn PC. Love it. Get off the PC. And it made me realize like, yeah, you can be you can be as logical as you want and you can try to be logical and someone can be logical to you, but it just fucking flies, it over, flies your head. over your head. Yeah, you're just not ready to get the you're advice. Not you're not ready, no. You're not you're not yeah. ready. And we need to understand that when we have frustrating blocks, think about me. I literally me I, I sit every week here talking about relationship with the game and even me yeah have 
you know, narratives creep into my head after yeah. rough blocks. Yeah, that is how brutal League of Legends as a game is. is. Absolutely. And so I just want to like let people know it's there is no shame and sometimes just accepting defeat to your own mind. You say, walk away and don't address it. Just chuck on some Netflix, go for a walk, whatever you need to do. Take a couple of days, break maybe. Take a day off or the evening off or whatever you need to do. It's okay. As long as it's not happening all the time. But then that, and then, and then what I did, I did some more reflection that, and when I'm more like, you know, sane, I said, all right, um, I definitely need to put Ari to the, just the back burner for now. Just get that out of my system for now, you know? And what I did, I said, you know what? I'm going to refresh my system completely, do a full system reboot. I'm just going to play right now, whatever I find fun. What, what my intuition wants to play, I'm going to play it. I've just been playing OG champs that I have fun with, like Rumble, um, I think I played Rumble, like a Lissandra game. I played a Renata game. Just played a bunch of champs that I find fun. And it was like a full system reset for me. I'm not, I didn't play those champs because I'm, I'm going to try to climb and get ELO. It's nothing about that. I know I'm going to lose ELO probably. But just as a complete reset and just to so get it out of my system. Mm. And then, oh, okay, I can get back to that. I think what it is when as well, Curtis, when we make guides is because we're literally thinking about the champ and how to teach the champion for like eight hours a day. Oh, you're like, thinking about it all the time. Too much. You it's overthink too much. things. You, over, you overthink things. Yeah, you things. lose You lose your mind. You lose your sector. I, I lose my, I lost my mind. <laughs> Everyone That's why right. I, guides are mentally taxing, dude, to make. Yeah. Like, they are exhausting. Well, our, our type of guides at our least guides. have three hour plus. Because you're thinking of everything. Like, yeah. should I, how, is that the right way to explain that? Yeah. What should I even include in the guide? Yeah. What if that, what, what are clients experiencing? What are people experiencing in their own games? Does that VOD clip even make sense? Is that replicable? All that stuff, you know? And it's exhausting. Anyway, glad that's done. But I just want to kind of share that experience because again, it happens to all of us. You're not alone. You're not alone in that. If we can't do it, we don't expect you guys to be able to do it all the time. No, we're not robots. We're not perfect. All right. Uh, we have a quick summer school post today, yep. Curtis scouring the community seeing how we can uh contribute maybe help out a little bit so this one here um has where is it 183 upvotes and 126 comments is failing to ping your teammates a misplay sometimes i'll be playing support for example and i know the jungler is coming i start to back off but my adc doesn't notice and goes for a trade my adc dies and now i'm alone in lane with not much to do Similarly, I see the enemy support go for a roam and I'm not able to match. I forget to ping the mid laner and they die to the gank. Are these misplays by me or should I just be focusing on my own play and let my teammates fend for themselves? So how would you classify this, Curtis? Yeah, what do you reckon? Huge mistake. It's a massive mistake. You, it is, is what I always say. It's my analogy, my metaphor. It is your responsibility to counter track your, uh, track your opponent. And, and just like in a traditional sport, your, it's your responsibility to track your man. If you're playing any sport, like we're playing soccer, football, whatever, it's like you have your opponent that you're dealing with. That's your guy. You got to track him. That's your responsibility. So that's kind of embedded in your role, no matter what role you play for top support, whatever. That is your, that's your guy. So at least for mid and most definitely for support, um, you got to track that support. And if they move, no matter, no matter what, you got to keep eyes on them. That's a huge Hmm. huge skill to develop and remember sometimes as well it's not um you it's you an might, end of review mistake by the way it's huge it's yeah. literally an end of review if, mistake. if you're you have to prepare as well like if you can't match something or like let's say you know your teammates maybe you gotta still ping in if you think your teammates not gonna listen just do your job that's your job that's your job you need to have a play prepared ready to go Yes, there's always think a response. About, it's like, okay, there's always a response. That's really important as well because yeah. sometimes I find people like they ping it and they're like, especially as a jungle, it's like, okay, so how are we going to use that information? Everyone, and Because more of what they're thinking is, I hope my laners listen to my ping rather than what's next. Yeah, what's next? They're, they're, like, drop they're ping, 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 ping. Now what do I do? You're just going to move on really quick. Just doing your job, moving on really quick. So I think that's really important. And jungle is really important because you're pretty. You're a, play, you're a person that can make plays on the side of the map. That's your job. You, the way, again, we frame it is, Nathan... How do I make the game as hard as and most as uncomfortable as possible for my opposition? Opposition. That's the way I like yeah. to frame it. This is literally what I say to my clients. If, they, if I'm like, okay, they can't follow a roam, and they and they and you know you ping them down the river. What would be the most annoying thing if you were that guy? That's the way you should think about it. Oh, would following be the most annoying? Would getting tower place be the most annoying? Would getting a quick reset be the most annoying? I don't know. Hmm. That's that's the question you need to answer. Put yourself in their shoes. Yep. 
And I guess you can flip it and thinking like, okay, I'm going to provide as much information as possible to my team to maximize my chances of winning this game. And again, don't stress about them not listening. You just have to be doing your job. I always think about my best League of Legends, Curtis. As a jungler, I'm pinging and tracking all three lanes. So I'm, I'm, I'm tracking mm. everyone. Mm. I, think, I think actually... That, that As a jungler, really that's the level. highest level. Yeah, that's yeah. the highest level. That's right. Especially mid-move. Mid-move specifically, really important to track. Because even if my laner pings it, I need to be prepared for it because that changes my, my decision-making a lot. For, as a jungler so it, it helps a lot i think um yeah that just t comes with intuition and time and you know that like i for example cupcakes roams like i don't even need to ping it i just feel it yeah you know what i mean like yeah. you know because so, so, you just you verse it so many times um we're actually gonna have cupcake on next episode aren't we well you're gonna sp you spoil it everyone spoil it? Oh, dang god it. damn it everyone's gonna know now that's our third one yes yeah, so we're gonna do it is that no it's our second one with him right third is that third yeah, oh done, you did an online, online once yeah. this is our third we do one every year, yeah. Essentially, so yeah, we're gonna get Cupcake back on. So that'll be good. Talk about some support coaching. Yep, get back into the details of support. Um, so yeah, so sum it up. Yes, you must at minimum track your your yes, counterpart. It's your responsibility, and don't be afraid if they don't listen to your pings. Just do your job. All right, well, let's get into the clips corner. Away <laughs> Here we go. So unoriginal. <laughs> And welcome everyone to Curtis's Clip Corner. All right, getting into the details, getting the juice out of this one. Um, nice, short, sharp little clip here today. Now, this is a Platinum Akali P4. Nathan, I'm going to show you, this is the scoreboard here. Now, for those of you who are listening... This is a 4-0 Akali by 14 minutes and 30 seconds inside of the game. We've got Dragon coming up in 20 seconds. We've got Rift Herald coming up in 45 seconds. This Akali has a 0-3 Sivir on her team, a 1-7 and seven center. She has a moderately strong 2-2 two two Kane and a you know a pretty strong Mordekaiser top who's 1-0. and oh. On the enemy team... Uh, the only real important stuff is that they've got a, there's a very fed Kaiser seven and one. Their bot lane bot absolutely destroyed this game. This is a huge bot differentiation. Okay. Now. Oh, this is so exciting to get us. I already have, I already have a plan for this right now as a jungler and then mid laner. I know what to do right now. So okay, great. Right. That, I actually, I'm, I actually don't think you know what I'm going to say here actually. But and that's not even my point. Oh, I want to problem solve this You one. can problem solve it if you want. We'll problem solve it in a second. Yeah. Just to educate the audience anyway. Yeah. But there's a separate point here. So, we talk a lot about communication and and communicating objectives and I guess being proactive about like what you want to do on the map. Now, sometimes one of the critiques I get in my coaching is like, Curtis, you know, do I, how do I, like, do I, should I feel responsible to call things in this ELO bracket, mm. like in platinum and gold and stuff mm. like that, right? Like, is that too much? Mm. And, and kind of one thing, of, yeah, it's a good question, right? Because you, you think, okay, well, I understand where you're coming from in Platinum. Do you, should you be calling objectives or not? Now, I've actually simplified it recently. And my point is this. If you are definitively the Fed member on your team, if you, and in this case, this is Carly, she's 4-0. She's by far the strongest member on her team right now. Does she have enough money for Rock Belt? Yeah, she's going to go Mythic. That's right. You know, you're very, very strong. Now, I said, in this situation, it's your responsibility to direct the team. If you are definitively the strong member, it is your responsibility. If you're 0-4 or you're 1-3, well, to be honest, especially in these lower ELO brackets, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me that much that if you kind of took more of a backseat when it comes to your macro decisions. Wait for them to make mistakes. Yeah, and like, you know, I don't expect you to be like a macro, you know, shot calling everything. But if you're 4-0, I think it's literally the polar opposite. You should, the game is theoretically played around you right now. Like you should be stepping up and mm. making a call. Mm. And what happens, you know, he goes back to base, buys a rocket bell. Goes so much dragon. is happening, right? Like dragon's about to come up, yeah. rift tower's about to come up. Yeah. There is not a single call made here. We don't know whether we're, we're contesting Rift on top side. We don't know if we we want it. Do we not want it? Do we want Hover on board side? Do we want to give Rift? We have no idea. So a color just waddles bot. The cane and the and the cane kind of walks into Rift looking to contest top side on, onto this Rift. She's kind of chilling on bot side. She's like, oh, wait. Oh, a fight's happening. Oh, sh should I TP? Hmm. I don't know. It randomly stumbles into the mid lane of bot. 
burns a flash, and then luckily the cane kind of Whoa, wins a fight on top side. The fight. Wow. And I said here, I said, you so just lucky. lucked out oh my so God. much. What should have happened is that your team should get aced on top side because yeah. you're the 4-0 member. You've got half of the team's kills and you didn't even TP to play with Rock about an ultimate. You, you didn't even know if your team was going to fight there. No. You didn't even you didn't even think about Just it. Just autopilot and bot. Just autopilot bot. Yeah. And so my point being, guys, and this is, again, another public service announcement. If you are definitively the strong member in your team heading into the mid game, it is your responsibility to decide whether or not that next objective should or shouldn't be contested and what should kind of happen. Give Dragon, contest Dragon. Give Rift, contest Rift. Uh, get call for hover on side lane or not. Yep. Is that pretty fair to say? Yep, and I don't want people to get really intimidated by that. Remember, we've actually talked about this before. Make the play, ping it, be aggressive, yes, and lose the game from it. You learn so much quicker that way. You'll never learn any improvement. You don't learn anything. Stuff. So, or, or let's say she, she wasn't sure. Mm. Let's say let's say this Akali wasn't sure whether or not they should fight this Rift Child. Make a decision. Make a decision, yeah. All right, contest it, fight it then. If you're not sure, fight it, yep. TP, and then we can review it later. Review and then think about alternatives. Because we have we have very little learning here Nothing because you made no decision. No. Pure luck, and if you Pure win luck. this game, it's a really bad game. You're not going to actually, it's yeah. It's you don't learn that much from a macro perspective. Yeah. So very important, guys. Step up. Yep. Yeah. When you're the strongest member, you of the get team. more learning. You'll get better results, and you'll get more learning. It's a win, 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 win. It's a win, 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 win. Right, I got to quickly problem solve this game. Right, here we go, Nathan. This is, yeah, this is Nathan's little uh, fetish. Okay. So she's gonna. I'm just. When is she tabbing here? Come on, tab. So she starts a recall here. All right. We got a tab I here. Believe. No, fast forward a little bit. Like here. Okay. I think and she's tapping. I think there. she tabs just at the start of the um at the recall. So we're just trying to sorry guys, we're just trying to find when she presses tab. It's like here. I'll butcher this one a little bit. I'm looking to compensate maybe for the cane there a little bit. Maybe we should be a little bit more yeah. quick on that recall. Right here. There we go. Alright, so what I do here, really simply. It's actually, even though, even though you're playing a Kali, you're playing an Assassin, it's still really hard to kill a Kaiser with these items and Thresh. There's too much peel. Mm, a uh, lot of peel, yeah. So you and actually Syndra. definitely given this dragon. Yep. And then I'm looking at, Yorick is a free kill, dude. You know what Jesus. I do right here? I'm going to do. Who are you as? Are you, who are you? I'm the Akali right now. Okay. Like, this is what I want Akali to do, okay? <laughs> yeah. I want her to fuck this off right now, the dragon yep. bot. Go straight top with Mordekaiser. Kill top the moment Yorick gets back to lane off his death timer. Again, the enemy team's gonna okay. fall over themselves. They're gonna, they're gonna, and then you're gonna be able to get. You're basically your pressure points, Mordekaiser, because Yorick's so easy for you to kill. What do you think, Curtis? It's an option. It's definitely an option. the The thing I'm iffy about is that you have TP, and it would be nice to utilize that. So, I, th yeah, I mean, it's an option. I think it's a pretty think high it's level a TP play. Or some shit. Yeah, it's a pretty high level play. Basically, I, what I'm trying to do here is because yeah. I don't want to slowly bleed out this game. I want to make it. This is this is the moment. I got my mythic. I want to make a play. I want to be aggressive here. And your pressure point is killing Yorick again. Mm. Yorick's going to start getting emotional. Bam! The enemy team's going to then he's dead, and then you're going to have a pressure point. You water cards will hold his ult. They might collapse. They'll you know what they'll do after that, Curtis? Mm. They'll fight the herald. Okay. And then Mordekaiser will still have ult, and then you kill Kaisa, and then bam. I still... Th yeah, I, I agree. I think it's a great play topside. I think, alternatively, you could just win the Rift fight, because I feel like Yorick can't team fight. Yep. You could like, I feel like well. you could literally just team fight this Rift. Yeah. Like, you, all you do, and what you could have done... I mean, yeah. You, actually, I do agree, though, in saying that if you went topside... And never went bot here. You went straight top. You went straight You're spamping top. in Mordekaiser And what you could top. do is you could sweep around here and get yourself into a great position. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're then gonna come back from They're gonna dragons. come there anyway, right? Yeah. And then you could just and then if they don't, it's fine. You can just let your team get the rift, you base it or just immediately TP back bot if they give it. Yeah. It's a win win. It's a win win. So I I like I do like pathing around that around that top side regardless. But I, I think also an e a really easy to execute is just run straight bot, mm. get that wave, and then TP, TP to top. And just just get in there. Just be around that area, be ready yeah. to fight and yeah. get on the back line or whatever you need to do. But yeah, again, um step up. If you're the Fed member. I right, suppose so I'm going to hijack the Curtis clips. We said that you were only going to do one clip. Nathan can't help himself here. Yeah, he sort of steal the show with a better too, clip. This is too good to what use. What are we talking and, about? And but this is this mid lane is stuff in here as well, guys, right? right? So right. This, is, this, is, this is a fun one. This is such a great example in terms of uh, people's obsession with fighting objectives. So this is a review. This is uh, uh, Spencer's about Platinum 1 and A. He's an Evelyn player. Um, 
let's pay attention here to mid lane. Right now, um, he's got an Aurelia that's 40 CS up on a Jace at eight minutes in the game. His team's relatively, I mean, they have zero kills. They're 2,000 gold down. He's an Evelyn level six with alt. Now, the the way that especially junglers think, when, especially when, like, you know, let's say you've got, quote unquote, a fed mid laner here, right? I already see where this is going. A <laughs> fed mid laner yeah. here. We've got to contest the objective. I have alt. People love contested objectives. They're not thinking about alternative options mm. here, Curtis, all right? Now, for the Spotify listeners, our, our rally right now, Curtis, explain what does our rally really want to do here? What would be great? What's happening right now? Well, Aurelia, just believe it or not, Aurelia is not amazingly strong in river skirmishes. No, just now in general, she just yep. has a she has a vamp. Yeah, she has. The, she, Aurelia is a Bork spiking champion. She needs Bork, and pre Bork, she's eh, she's not amazing. I mean, she doesn't even have major. She doesn't even have like the. I mean. Vamp Scepter plus maybe Pickaxe, I think is a different story. Then you have a pretty boatload of AD. But she's not overly strong. She's also, I don't know if that is accurate. She's very R-reliant. Aurelia, like, if she doesn't have R, like, she's, like, really weak, by the yeah, way. Yeah, she doesn't have R, remember, she had no she's R. She's really, really yeah. weak. So you you basically, Aurelia is, needs Bork and she needs R. They're, like, two two key things. Yeah. So I guess this is sort of... But showing... she does love team fighting around neutrals. That is one thing she does like to do So when really, she has R. Really important to know here, just because, yeah, you're 40 CS up on a land. She hasn't mean... spent her goal, right? Yeah. I'm assuming she would be sitting goal. on a lot of That's goal right. right now. All right, so he wants to go fight the objective. Long story short, uh, she actually, she actually did have ult for the fight. She did have right. ult. But they end up losing the fight, and then um, it gives us hard because it's a bit of a review. But anyway, they lose the fight. It's a disaster. Yep. Bam, they all yep. die. All right. And then what I say, the alternative option here is let them get the Rift Hell, mm -hmm. concede the objective. Yep. Right now, Aurelia is slow building a mid wave here. Jace has gone to help the Rift Hell. What you do as Eve, you stand yes. right here. You kill the Jace. You deny three oh, waves. You yeah. are now, the, Jace will leave the game. The game is absolutely over. And again, this is sort of... So essentially for the listeners, what, what Nathan was proposing was that so the, the enemy let the enemy team do the rift as Evelyn kind of camp in the lane because the Aurelia had the, the way frozen mid. Yeah. So then as soon as the Jace comes back from helping the objective, he's going to come back, try and unbreak the freeze. And then um, and then Evelyn's ready there waiting. But what happens if Echo comes? They just 2v2. Well, the thing is, is that Echo probably, I mean, he, I mean, yeah, sure, maybe he should come. come. That's what he, he would come, come, right? But we've got vision there. We've got vision. Yeah, we've we got can, vision. We're all good to go. As in, you don't have to fight it if you don't want to. But laners never expect you to be there just when they're yes, right back in the lane. Yes, I die. It's I've a psychological that thing, a right? Lot, yeah. I mean, even you guys. I've died to that a lot. But I just want to say here as well, like, um, why the hell was she contesting that rift? That that makes no sense. Think about it. Your top's getting shit on. Yeah. Well, again, the mindset is that my rally is really far ahead. I'm an EV level six. But what what, what makes her, what her makes her say she's really far ahead? Look at the items, dude. Yeah. Well, that's where we get into the details. And yeah, like, look at the items. Ahead. Yeah. And with the same level as well. If anything, Jace is probably yeah. I think Jace strong, is probably stronger here, stronger here yeah. potentially. Yeah. Or well, very close. We didn't actually mention that review. But and also, yeah. Evelyn sucks at team fighting at this stage. Mm. Everyone's not a team fighting jungler. Well, some of us have like a skirmish or something like that, but yeah, but just in general, everyone yeah. wants to create picks. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, that's, that's like right. a, yes. it, tying back to Evelyn's identity. Yep. Evelyn wants loves trading off objective and just farming, you know, just getting... And yep. then you're looking for picks. You're looking for, like, yep. people out of position, right? And you don't even have to... Even if you just dive the Jace, even if you got a, yeah. you got a slow yeah, building wave right. here, like, it's all good. You know, this wave and the next wave's coming out of base. And I'm, as you can yeah. see on the review, I'm using my arrows, I'm saying. We're going to use this wave. We're just going to let them get Herald. Give the objective. You can get bigger. But at a high players. level, you know, earlier on in the in this podcast, we're talking about um, the Kiana player with the R usage. The question that she was asking every review was, okay, what did I get from this R and what are the alternative ways that I could have used my R? It's the same premise when contesting objectives or with a team fight, right? We talk about, okay, what did we get from contesting this? What happened? Yep. What are the alternatives? If I don't contest this rift or I give this rift, what could I have done? Could I have taken the, the opposite side jungler's camps? Could I have dove bot? Could I have got dragon instead of contesting the rift? Could I have reset gun tempo, done something else? These are the sorts of things that you should be thinking about. If Absolutely. you're a, it doesn't matter if you're a jungler or a mid laner or a top or whatever, same shit. You go to a major pivotal moment, whether it's a major objective fight, a major skirmish, a major team fight, and then you weigh up, you, you zoom in, like, is what we call the micro macro framework. This is what I talk about in my program, micro getting into the specifics, ability uses, target selection, all that good stuff. Zoom out now after that. 
Big picture, is this even a fight really worth taking? Zoom in, micro, zoom out, macro. And then you can kind of weigh up alternatives. And that, that's why you get the full range, the full spectrum. And what we're talking about here is zooming out. We're talking big picture. Thinking about the value of the gold. Let's say even if for some reason we trade one for one and we lose the Herald. Let's say that's a, you know, that's pretty much a net. Oh, that's like one, man, I guess. Let's say we get the Herald. Uh, that's about like a 500 gold play, let's say, with the Herald getting some plates. If we deny Jace these next two waves, can and get the kill, that's an 1,000 gold play. Mm. So you've just, um, yeah, you just you think about it in terms of gold values. And I always, that's always what I'm emphasizing in jungle. I've mentioned the podcast before. I'm trying to get people to think away from contesting objectives, kills to thinking about how can I get more net gold for my team and myself. Love it. All right, mailbag time, Curtis. Away we go. All right, our first question here comes from Boris. Title of this email is Champion Mastery for Noobs. Uh, hey, Nathan. He doesn't mention Curtis, just hey, Nathan. I love this. This is my mailbag. Long backstory. Uh, my brother got me listening to the podcast after recently getting back into LOL after many years off. I used to grind ranks, never really improving, but always trying to get those juicy rating points. Got stuck in Platinum as an insanely toxic player around 2013, 2014. In retrospect, surely blaming and flaming my teammates due to my own lack of understanding. Eventually got my account permabanned and moved on to other competitive games. <clears throat> Coming back years later to play with old friends, I realized how horrible I really am at the game and how little I respect I had for the level of difficulty, as you guys say. Actually, trying to understand the game and improve is really exciting and refreshing. I really appreciate you and Curtis's mentality and approach to the game. It's like the light at the end of the toxicity tunnel I've been trapped in. Question, how to feel champ mastery? In episode 108, Curtis talks about a feeling of a champ mastery where you know exactly how to maximize your impact to win games. I'm struggling with that while trying to master Gragas jungle. I've played slightly over 100 games this season and I consistently have games where I can get a decent lead early to mid game but I feel like I'm struggling to identify win conditions and close out the game. I feel like I'm lacking that feeling of champ mastery where I can always identify concrete goals and win conditions. The more I think about that in game, the more I get overwhelmed and start to underperform. It's like I do best on autopilot, but then I have just have to get lucky because I'm not making high quality decisions. I think a part of this might be ingrained in muscle memory from thousands and thousands of games I played back in the day with really poor habits and near zero decision making. TLDR, how can I develop a process to improve my champ mastery, specifically rated to win conditions, maximizing my impact? Reviewing my own games works for simple mistakes, but the high level concepts seem to go over my head. It's an interesting question. Um, do you as a jungler, so do you want to start Yeah, so I want to just give some context. So, mm. Gragas is a champion that I would say is more on the difficult end of jungling. At the end of the day, you can't really just take over a team. Like, you can only do really damage to, like, one person. You know, like, the, the Flash E. I mean, you know, you still can, you know, team fight well and that sort of stuff. But it's more on the difficulty side of... of, of his, I don't know what rank he said he's in. He said he's previously played He was Platinum in Season 3, so yeah. we have no idea where he is. No now. idea where he is. So maybe Gold Probably Gold, I'm assuming Gold. This is a very difficult champion with not very clear reference points. So that already makes it harder. It's very versatile, right? Very he has versatile a lot of versatility, champion. a lot of options. Sometimes you, you can, can peel, you, you can, can die, die you can split mage. the fights. Yeah. I've seen very creative team fighting with Gragas. Mm. Crazy stuff. Mm. And yeah, so he says that he's having, you know, it sounds like he's, he's, but he's struggling to close out games. And yeah, like playing Gragas, it is hard to close out games. Gragas, champs, like I, I played a bit of Gragas and you can have early, good early games really easily, but that's the level of difficulty of the champion. So don't be, I'll be not too, you might be like gaslighting yourself in a way saying mm. that I don't know how to learn champ mastery when you're just playing a real difficult champion yeah. with no clear reference People, points. it reminds me a lot of Ari. A lot of people struggle with the same thing with Ari because she's so versatile. You can peel, you can dive. And a lot of people kind of drop Ari for that very reason because it's too overwhelming. Too many options. There's too many options. There's too many things you can do. You can shove, you can roam. It, it, it's too much for people. 
So, I mean, in terms of development process, everything we just sort of listed, and, and for me as well, like, you know, how, you, how your flat plane fights, you mentioned those are simple and small mistakes. That's winning those mid-game, late-game fights, I think will actually be the biggest thing, will actually help you a lot. I wouldn't even be worried too much about, I mean, win conditions, maximizing impact, yes, that's going to be important as well for your champion. Playing around, hovering the right lanes and the side lanes. But, uh, you know, his question is about champ master. I think that's I, different. I, I've got something to say about this one, Nathan. Okay. I think it's very important that in your mind, Boris, that you separate game understanding mm. and champion mastery, mm. right? I'm sure that there are things that you could do better from a champ mastery perspective. There is no doubt about that. But then there is also kind of game holistic concepts that you need to understand. So let's say hypothetically, Boris, you are a platinum four player. Okay. In order to get to diamond four, you don't Necessary. It's not like you're only going to work in champ mastery, and that's only that's gonna, the only thing that's going to get you to diamond four. You're going to have to get better at the game holistically and understanding win conditions, using your lol states, other things that are holistic to the jungle role slash game, as well as develop champ mastery. These are kind of two separate concepts that both need to be improved at the same time. Okay, well, not necessarily at the same time, but they're still going to have to focus on something. But they're they're slowly, yeah, they're going to be bouncing together because you you learn both in a game. You know, you, you pick up on things. So so think of it. You got to okay. So you're simultaneously learning your champion as well as how to kill the nexus. There's actually kind of two separate things, right? So what I would recommend is first and foremost. If you're struggling with skirmishing and team fighting with those very versatile champions like Gragas, I would highly recommend laser focusing on it in your reviews, but also getting inspiration from other Gragas players. Literally, what I would do if I was him, go onto YouTube, type in Mar Challenger Gragas Solo Queue, load up a shit ton of odds. There's going to be a lot of you know ones that they get ahead early. Okay, that doesn't matter. That's your, that's your problem, right? It doesn't matter. Then go to the, the mid-game skirmishes. Go to all of the 3v3s, the 4v4s. Go to those skirmishes. Now, before the play happens, pause it. Look at the game state. Ask yourself, what would I probably do here? If he's approaching this dragon, what would I do? Pause it. And then play it out. See how different the decisions are. Hmm. What I specifically want to ask you as well is how he, they use the each ability specifically. Yes, Their Q, I love this. their E, their R. It's massive. A huge tip, Nathan's absolutely spot on here. When you're developing your skirmishing, it is best to get very uh, specific with the ability. So when I learned Fizz and I watched Mango Fish, the best Fizz in China, I literally looked first and foremost at his Q usage. How is he using Q? And compared his Q usage to my Q usage. Then I went to his E and looked at his E usage. When you get very ability specific, you unlock a fucking the game. You play a different game of different League of Legends. Different game of Legends. So yeah. I would look at his, how is he using Qs? How's he using his E's in fights? How's he using his R? Do it one by one. Look at the ability usage. What is he trying to get done? And then do that again and again and again and again. Watch a shit ton of those VODs of those team fights and expose yourself to a wide variety of how those fights are played out. Then start to look at your team fights gaining inspiration from those VODs, you'll start to see some trends. Oh shit, I'm actually, that's probably not the best way to use my R in this situation. I probably could have used it to peel in this situation instead of dive, or I probably should have held my E here. These are the sorts of things that you'll be observing. And these are very big because they change the fight massively. Mm. So that's what I would recommend for the champ specific. And that would take you a very far, a long way, I think. And then for the, um, you know, holistic win con stuff. Look, uh, just gonna chip away chip at that. Away at it, you know, yeah. just have a hypothesis, test it, test it, refine see if it, it works. You know, that's the only way you're gonna learn. We can. It's literally stuff. just have a hypothesis. I thought this was my win con. What happened? Oh shit. Okay, maybe that didn't work because I didn't account for that champion. Mm. Then move on. It's mm. a long term iterative process. Or you can join Nathan's program and speed it up. Yes, uh, <laughs> that I mean, is well. absolutely. Especially if you're playing a champ like Gragas. I think. Uh, Joining Soul 2 so will help you speed that up a lot, especially the wing condition stuff. Yeah, but, you know, like I said, the, the VODs would help for sure. Closing out games, yeah. All right, our next question here comes from Ferrick. Uh, the title of this email is Getting Back Into Ranked in a Letter of Thanks. Hello, Curtis and Nathan. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now, and I'd like to thank you guys for showing me a new way to enjoy League and share with you some of my journey. I've played on and off since about season two. Back in season four and five, I reached platinum five fairly quickly within around 50 games, only playing off intuition. 
but I had pretty major issues with self-confidence and I would start cold sweating every time I pushed the fine match button. So ranked anxiety stopped me from ever climbing further. In the seasons following, I've only played ranked to get to gold and to get my Victoria skin until 2021 where I didn't even manage to get that, finishing silver. Uh, but throughout the years, I've slowly built some confidence. So with that and actually being able to enjoy solo queue after discovering you guys and focusing on improvement, I decided to give the season a shot. I started off playing jungle as that was the role I've played the most recently. Climbing from silver to gold only to realize that while I like jungling when playing with friends, I don't really enjoy playing the role in solo queue. So I decided to commit to the role uh, I always seem to come back to, which oddly enough is AD carry. Now, I don't have as much time as I used to with a full-time job and other responsibilities, so I struggled a lot with re reacquainting, 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 reacquainting myself with lane mechanics and manage expectations of both myself and my teammates. But listening to you guys every week helped me overcome these struggles. So after about 90 games total, I'm happy to say I've once again reached platinum. I couldn't have done it without you guys, so thank you for all the great content and what you do for the league community. It's more of a success story there, Curtis. Wow. Getting back into ranked. It's amazing. Severe ranked anxiety. Cold sweats. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, props to you. I mean, thank you so much for sharing that because there are a lot of people out there that also we've worked with that have had ranked anxiety in it, and it's quite debilitating, right? Even if you enjoy the game, not being able to queue up and, um, and get better as a player. And so... Yeah, that's amazing. Really, really awesome story. Yep. And again, think about how much, you know, you're... It's just such a good thing way to learn. Like, if you're afraid of doing something, now you're going to learn, okay, I just need to just attack it head on. And I love that he was honest with himself about not liking that role. Yeah, and that's a really like, good story. Sometimes it is a tough call because like, oh, you know, I haven't played Eddie Carey much recently and, you know, it's Jungle's comfortable. He's probably played it a lot recently. That's a hard decision to come to. Like, he didn't really talk about it there, but I can... I know that those decisions are very difficult um it's going in the deep end essentially you know by himself now i'm not playing with friends anymore and I, you know and and playing a role that he's probably given up a few times in the past so props to him for really sticking to his guns and committing to what he really enjoys about league and that's gonna that's gonna allow you to get it's like sort of a little bit of a hack to get over rankings like i just want to play the game play the champion play the things that i want to because hmm. if you don't enjoy playing the champion it's going to be even harder to hit the queue up button very if you hard. have ranked anxiety on top of that as well very very hard I will do one more question here from John. Tyler's email is solutions to autofill. Hi, Curtis and Nathan. Uh, John here. Again, not sure if you remember me. I'm the guy who plays a all 80 carries in Master. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it rings a bell. After hitting Master again this season, now Master for the past four seasons. Brief update on my last riding. Nowadays, I still play all ADCs, but took your advice and rotated a pool of around five champs at a time. It's been going great. I wanted to ask about how you guys tackle being autofueled. For me, the only role I'm relatively comfortable playing other than ADC is support, since I lane with them and can understand their role more. When I get autofueled in Master, I feel completely lost, especially in top and jungle. If I'm mid, I pick Lucian, Korkiel, Tristana and get by with my champ mastery. To combat this, I tried this solution. I used to play, uh, I used to my, I used my Plat Smurf to learn other roles for about two months per role. I would alternate alternate days between three blocking on my main and playing ADC and three blocking on my smurf on either top or jungle. I found that this did somewhat help to understand the roles better, but eventually concluded it wasn't worth the time to learn roles I don't even like. For context, I focus on Camille, top and Graves jungle. I found at the end that in top, even at plat level, I mostly lose lane to top mains that actually no one understand matchups. Um, and which I didn't even after two months. And the top lanes I do win are mostly from master level mechanics. While in jungle, I'm generally clueless in AFK farm, unless there's a gank so obvious, it's like a flashing red light. Then I show up at objectives. In both roles, it just feels really bad. When I die once or twice, top it basically feels basically over. And in the jungle, I have no idea what I'm doing. I basically only play AD carry, but I'm getting autofill very often recently, like every other game, to the point where it's a problem, especially since there's no way I can play them at a master level. I was wondering what you guys thoughts on my experience and what you would suggest going forward. Wow, I've I actually have not heard of someone getting auto filled that often. Mm. Secondary role is different, right? Like we all get secondary role, and it's your responsibility to be competent on your secondary role, but not okay, auto fill. So the first question I want to ask is: Is this an exaggeration? Because you know, because mm. uh, you know. I, I always have to say this because I hear I get questions about this all the time and stuff about autofill and like questions and I say how much is this actually happening? And basically, what's happening is psychologically they've just weighed these events so highly that they think it's happening all the time. 
So let's say that, let's trust him. Let's say that it's happening a lot. Well, we literally just think this is just not possible. I, I, I don't really think it's possible. Because uh, for me, I mean, I play jungle and support. And if I get mid or top, I just dodge straight up. Yeah, I dodge as well. It's just so rare. I dodge top or jungle. And and again, we we play yeah. on a very low populated server. We have about a pool of for we're us playing challenger grandmaster games. We only have we can only get possibly matched with about three four hundred players. Yeah, we just, we get secondary role a lot. Though. Yeah, I play support a lot. But that's fine. That's fine. You got to you got to you got to learn your secondary. You got to learn your secondary role. So I, I I would really look at the numbers. Yeah. Again, it's it might because again. Yes, those autofill games are very painful. So you might be getting a little bit confused about yeah. how often they're happening because we obviously register painful experiences more than positive. Um, and I would dodge them and then just play uh, play your main and secondary role. I think there's something out there, by the way. I, I'll see if I can link it, if I remember to link it. Um, my coach in the MLA, one of the coaches in the MLA, Mysterious, actually has a video on his YouTube channel about how to kind of avoid... There's like things you can do to avoid uh, autofill a little uh. bit more. One of them, I believe, off the top of my head, is that if the t- if the queue goes over... It's like eight or 10 minutes, you should stop it and then requeue. Because it's going to try and find a game for you and put you in another role. It's yeah. going to put you... Exactly. Because yeah, if the queue's too long, it increases the chances, I believe, of autofill. Because it's like struggling to find you a game. Uh, I think... And now, again, I don't know if that's true or not but from what i've heard there are people in the MLA that live by that stuff and they don't get their autofill basically uh, at all very interesting so um but for me i don't do that and i generally just get secondary yeah, and we have 30 minute queues. and what you can do if you do get top or jungle or mid ask can i please ad carry or support mm. like you know who knows it's maybe increasing your odds you just increase your odds do that as well and then dodge right mm. so uh, I, I don't yeah I don't really want you to waste time and you shouldn't be wasting a single second on any of those other three roles. Focus on your AD carry and focus on your support. That's it. Yeah. And even if you let's say let's say if you play a three block and you get two autofill games, which I think is just impossible. Yeah. Max you one, get max max one. Just dodge that. Just one. dodge it's that fine. one. Re queue. You're all good. It's like it's five fine. minutes. Yeah. Fine. And the LP, it's like pretty low. You you know you get so much LP nowadays. So it's not let, a big let's deal. say you're even playing two blocks a day, right? Again, at max, you should only get what you, would, you could only possibly get in one order fill. Then you can only play four games that day and just dodge both of them. You've got 30 minutes, you know, you're fine. You can play the next day. Not that bad. It's still fine. You can, in those four games, you can be getting a lot of progress. Yep. And you're not wasting those two games. Because they are literally a straight waste of time. Yes, correct. Yep, so I think that's our solution there Yeah, <laughs> to that. But I'll try and remember to post that video. I, I believe Tim has it on his channel, Mysterious yep. LOL. But I'll see if I can link it in the description. Excellent. All right, that's it for our episode today, everyone. Good work. Keep on improving. See you next time.